now we are back at my original location, which is Du Bois Town. Du Bois Town uh, Fire Department in Lycoming County. Lycoming County. Uh, and this is the uh, crew that runs the drone program here. Introduce yourself for me. I'm Tim Heiler. Okay. I'm Paul Vavra. And you guys are going to be showing us a couple of different things that we haven't seen even today. And you know, we've been to three different locations already and we've seen a, a bunch of different things, but we're going to take a closer look at your underwater drone and then we're going to actually fly a drone in the dark. This is one of the things that I've never done before. Even flying my own drones, uh, I'm not allowed to fly at night. <laughs> so it's going to be unique, but you have some special things on this. Can you tell me what you have on your drone? Sure. The drone has a spotlight. It has a thermal camera. We have a, a beacon light. Uh, it's anti-collision, anti-aircraft collision light uh, that's added on to here. And this drone does not have remote ID on board. So we have a drone tag that a module added on that provides that remote ID service. That is very cool. Now, is this, what kind of drone is this? Is this a DJI or is this? It's an Autel Evo 2 Enterprise. Okay. Now, one of the things that we've been talking about as we've been traveling today is the expense of these kind of things. It's been a very expensive venture to create a um, drone program for any single firehouse. The fact that you guys have uh, created this task force, task force 81, if I'm correct, um, is something that's very unique and I, I appreciate you guys doing that. Can you tell me one of the things that you find as a benefit to having a task force versus just a fire department doing it on their own? Yeah, the support of the other departments, uh, they're on standby. If we have a call here locally in Lycoming County, they're asking us from Laporte, hey, do you guys need our help? They're calling up from New Berlin, hey, do you guys need our help? So we know that they're there for us if, if we need the support, if we need extra flight time, that kind of thing. You know, if we're running low on batteries or we're getting fatigued, that kind of thing, they can come up and take over for us then. Okay, about how close are each of these? I drove today, it was, seems like about an hour between each station, is that about right? Yeah, that's right. Um, it's about an hour. Uh, and we have another department up in Tioga County to our north out of Wellsboro that is also part of the group. Okay. And so we, we cover four counties. Wow. So about how much territory is it? How many miles of territory? That's Hundreds? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, Lycoming County, Pennsylvania is the largest county in the state of Pennsylvania. So you can easily go 85 miles from one corner to the other and stay within the county the whole time. So that's pretty much the entire state of Delaware. Yeah, <laughs> pretty close. <laughs> yeah, we're actually larger than the state of Rhode Island. Wow, that, that's absolutely amazing. Well, I appreciate you guys for doing what you're doing. You know, volunteerism in general is on a decline. So hopefully by highlighting some of these new things that fire departments are doing and public safety people are doing, uh, we'll start to motivate the next generation to join and start volunteering. Uh, you can do a lot of cool things and drones is one of them in my opinion. That's right. And I am not a firefighter. I'm not trained in firefighting. I'm not an EMT. I am just a drone pilot. Okay. So that's a possibility for people that don't want to get involved in those other things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect guy I'm talking to then. That's exactly what we're looking for. Thank you for your service. You are part of the fire department because you do this. So we appreciate you. So Paul, let's go ahead and start with your drone because okay. you have the underwater drone. Unfortunately, we can't throw it in the water because it's 10 o'clock at night already. <laughs> uh, but let's talk about your drone a little bit more. This is one we saw initially on the table when uh, Chief Hope was helping us, right? Correct. Okay, tell me a little bit more about it. This is a Thighfish V6 Expert. It is a remote operated vehicle or ROV. It is an underwater drone that can be used to retrieve objects for law enforcement, provide support to our local dive teams. We have the Susquehanna River here, which makes this a very useful piece of equipment. As you can see, it has a camera on it like an aerial drone does. It also has two 
3,000 lumen spotlights on each side of the front to illuminate down below in the dark in the water. It has six motors which propel it through the water and it can be connected at the back to a tether system. 200 meters of cable, roughly 330 feet, I can run this out. Holy cow, that, that's a ways down. <laughs> I don't think in many scuba can you actually go that far without being highly certified in specialties. Battery time on this is approximately five hours under average conditions. Extreme temperatures can reduce that time, whether you have extreme hot water or extreme cold water, icing conditions will significantly reduce the battery life on it. It takes approximately one hour to charge the battery. Okay. I noticed that the, you know, basically fins or jets or whatever, what are they even called? Um, they're in obviously arrangement that is unique. Can you explain to me why they are that way? It's omnidirectional, which means it can go in different directions. It can also roll, pitch forward, backward, yaw up and down, and the motors kind of provide the stability to go through the current because that's another factor when using this. Sometimes you have significant currents which can make this hard to maneuver and the six propellers give it the stability to navigate the current okay yeah it's a very cool looking drone it almost looks like a little spaceship uh, <laughs> um, but uh, how many times have you had a chance to use this we use this approximately once a month okay and are you always looking for people or are you looking for objects what do you what do you use it for what are some of your missions Law enforcement has requested us to use it to help retrieve potential evidence for them in certain situations. We did get called to a water rescue where there was a drowning involved to provide support to the dive team. So it can be used for a couple different scenarios. Do you normally launch it off the shore or do you have a boat that you launch it off? We normally launch it off the shore, but we do have the ability to take this out on a boat, which gives you that extra capability of having a better vantage point for launching it because you're always going to be attached to the tether and having the boat gives you the advantage of starting out at a better position than rather than just launching it straight off of the shore. Okay. With a tethered like system, do you worry about debris that's in the water, especially in a river? Like, you know, I, I've been tubing down the rivers and I noticed there's a lot of rocks, there's a lot of woods and stuff like that. As you can see, this has a tough shell on it. So it does have scratches from what you just mentioned. The concern with the tether is getting tangled, obviously, but with practice, we try to avoid that if at all possible. Just careful cord management. This is not necessarily a one person operation. Two people are ideal, one person to navigate the ROV and another person to maintain the cord reel. Okay. Now, if it were to get stuck underwater or something like that, do you have a backup diver that would have to go in to get it? Or how does that work? Two of our members are certified divers, if that ever should be the case. The other option is to cut the tether and purchase a new one. <laughs> but those aren't cheap. No, they <laughs> so, are not. Well, Paul, I mean, this is fantastic. Hopefully one day I can come back out and actually see this thing in action. Maybe we can set up a scenario where your divers go out and we use your drone to go find an object or something. That'd be really cool to see. Sure. So thank you for taking your time out of your day and night to not only drive me around to all these stations, but uh, to show me everything that you have. Of course. Uh, I appreciate the task force and what they're doing. So now we go back to the other drone here. So the one thing that I noticed as I've gone to every one of you guys uh, stations is you have um, pads. Is that a requirement for the FAA to have a, a landing pad? It's not a requirement to have a landing pad like this, but it helps, especially if you're not on a parking lot like this. If you have grass or leaves or something like that, the rotors trim the grass for you. Okay. <laughs> and so it provides a, it's a target really when you're coming down to land is something to aim for. 
and you know that within that circle there's no debris or anything like that that's going to affect the drone, you know, damage the drone or anything like that. It's also kind of an isolation zone. People aren't going to be in that space. Okay. Because so they, that's the drone's landing zone. So where do I need to be? Just kind of step out of the way? Yeah, you're fine right there, I guess. So this is the anti-collision light. It's required to be visible, I think, three statute miles. Okay. Uh, it's obviously very bright. Yeah, yeah. When you're flying at night, one of the things you need to not do is blind yourself by looking at that light. Okay. Um, you need to you, you need, need to a, get in the dark and keep your night and, vision and up. keep it dark. Rotor's hot. Oh, it's quiet. So this drone has a landing light. You can see it's lit up our landing zone now, and uh, it automatically goes off after you get to a certain height. And you can manually turn it on as well if you need to see what's underneath the drone. So it says it's self-checking. And we can turn the thermal on. Oh, wow, check that out. So there we are, you can see the... I turn this down, I might be able to see it even better. There's multiple settings, so in this case, uh, you can see black is hot. So look at our arms compared to our shirts. Right. And we can change. Uh, black hot is nice for certain situations. Uh, if you're out in a cornfield, the deer that's standing out there will light up just, you know, it's just a black dot in the field. Okay. And so then you can see it really well. But there's a bunch of other color schemes. Appreciate you taking the time and kind of showing us the different settings. It almost looks like the uh, ticks that they have on the engines that we use for fire services. Yes. Uh, kind of the same thing. That's a thermal image. I, I typically like white hot or black hot. Okay. There's less, less noise on it. That's a personal thing. Other people like other things for different reasons. But we're at night, okay? It's dark out here, past 10 o'clock at night, but you can see all those buildings, the details of all those things. All right. Now, uh, just to show the effect of it, let's go back to the, there's, yeah. there's color. So you can see the closest house, but anything beyond those lights, you really can't see. So as soon as you switch it over, you can see all the houses. Now you'll notice that house got closer. The resolution of the thermal camera is quite a bit less than the resolution of the the color camera. Okay. We're 640 by 512. Okay. Is what we are. That's a, that's a common resolution for thermal imagery. Let's see if we can locate Paul and then put a spotlight on him. All right. So we have uh, black is hot and you can see his black. Okay. He's over by the truck there. He's standing there. Okay. Then I'm going to pan over the camera here, see if I can find him just in the dark. So even in the dark, I cannot see him with my own camera. And we can change colors and now you can see him. Some of these red ones, you know, you can clearly see that that's a person standing there. Right. White hot, black hot, there he's moving. So then you can kind of track him where he's going there. Yep. Let's see if we can put the spotlight on him. Yep. So I already know, since I've flown here before, I know I don't have power lines over my head and okay. that kind of thing. So, but if you're not familiar with where you're flying in the dark, yeah, you need to look around. We have some light poles here. I'm higher than the light pole, uh, but you got to know. I went to an incident. There were really high lines there, and we had to in the dark look and where are the poles? Okay, the lines must be here so that we're not running into the lines, it's a major safety concern. Right. There have been many drone crashes into power lines because the obstacle avoidance systems- Couldn't pick it up. Don't pick up the power lines. Okay. I've seen many videos of drones All right, so I'm gonna see crashing. if I can pick this up with just my camera while it's flying there. Okay. So I've turned it back to color. Okay. And here's the weak setting on the spotlight. All right, I'm tilting the camera down. Now we'll turn it on the weak spotlight setting. There we can, and he's reflective, so it's easier to see. I'll turn it up to, this is the middle. And I'm not using thermal now, because I'm using the spotlight. Right. Here's the strong 
light. So what we can do with a the thermal, say, well, and in this case, this is clearly a person standing there on the thermal, but if you're not sure, then you can turn the spotlight on and turn the color back on and say, oh, yep, we for sure have a person standing there or laying there or, or crawled underneath right. of something. Or... It lights up that pretty much a whole parking lot. And that is on low? It's on strong. It's on strong now. Okay. Now, if we wanted to light up a scene, I should have tilted it down a little bit farther. I'm fighting with this light pole that's here. It's kind of in my way. But, you know, now we can we can light up incident command or, or something like that. Or, hey, we're... We can't get a fire truck with a spotlight on it to where we need to light up. So now we've lit it up with this drone to do whatever we need to do. You know, the um, Ron Warren of the Wellsboro department, uh, he wasn't able to be part of this tour. He has used the spotlight on his enterprise drone for rope climbing. To okay. Su the support the firefighters. Yeah. In uh, Blackwell, the Pennsylvania Grand Canyon, there were some hikers that got stranded on ice and had to be rescued. Wow. So they used ropes to climb down the mountain after dark yep. to find the, to retrieve these hikers. And Ron lit up the climbing scene with his drone to protect the firefighters that were doing the rescue. That's pretty cool. So. That's, That's exactly what these things are. And you can see for. we're lighting up that ambulance over there. Right. You could work under this light. Yeah. Bring it back in. We appreciate it. <laughs> and it's pretty quick to swap out batteries. Like I said earlier, we have uh, eight batteries. I carry eight batteries that fit in this drone. If they're fully charged, I can get about 30 minutes of flight out of each battery. Okay. So we can fly for a while. Remote ID is basically uh, law enforcement with the right scanner can identify the drone, find out where the pilot is. Okay. It's a it's a safety thing. So if there's a if there's an issue with a drone somewhere, they'll be able to find figure out where the operator may be hiding. The pretty slick drone. I appreciate the service that you're doing. And the fact that, you know, you're one of those guys that aren't a firefighter and this is something that you were doing in your job. What's your normal job? What do you know, you know, obviously you're a volunteer here, uh, but what do you do for a living? So I work for the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. Okay. I work with farmers, help them implement conservation practices on their farm. Uh, everybody hears about the farm bill you know, the farm bill is this and that, and it's getting passed. And, uh, well, I run farm bill programs. Okay. Um, so uh, conservation practices on farms uh, to address resource concerns, soil, water, air, plants, animals, humans, and energy. Right. Are the priority resource concerns that we're, we're aiming to correct. Right. One of the other things that uh, came up in um, the drone ban that we talked about earlier today at one of the other stations is, you know, the emergency services having problems with a potential ban, right? Yeah. But a lot of agriculture and farms now use drones rather than crop dusters and stuff to do their work. Yes. Do you run across those? Yeah, there's a guy that we're working with uh, that uh, he and another farmer partnered together to get a drone. Uh, they initially wanted it for for fungicide in wheat. Okay. Uh, and that was a, what they thought would be a cost-effective way to do that. Uh, the reason they got into it is because uh, they hired a, a helicopter pilot to do it. The helicopter pilot crashed and died. Ooh. And so they said, we don't want to have a fireball in our, in our field. Right. We'll go buy a drone. It cost them like $35,000 to buy this drone but they cover enough acres, they figured it would pay for it. And they started a business, now they fly for other farmers as well. Yeah. So they can spray, they got all the, which is it's a lot more than part 107 for this. Sure. They got all the certifications necessary to spray from a drone. The drone is larger than 55 pounds, so it's a different category of certifications okay. and those kind of things. But they can spray, they can spread cover crops on standing corn. Uh, that's a big thing in, in 
agriculture is how do we get cover crops on earlier so they're taller going into winter to protect the soil. Yeah, yeah. So that's one, op and they were looking at um, locally here, we've had gypsy moth outbreaks. They're destroying the oak trees. They defoliate the oak trees. So they got into spraying for gypsy moths. Small landowners can't always afford to have a, a private a pilot come in and spray in an airplane or a helicopter. It's not feasible for that. And most of those drones that you see, are they foreign drones or are they American-made drones? DJI is the number one drone manufacturer in the world. Yeah. It's a Chinese company. But not company. only would it affect public safety, but it would affect, affect agriculture across America yeah. if a, a, a band like that actually made it through yeah. the way they initially intended it. And uh, so DJI is, is kind of in the crosshairs. This drone here is Autel. It's also a Chinese drone. So it's kind of you know, the best is, is being yeah. targeted. And uh, maybe you could argue the second best, Autel, is also in the target for that. So it's a, it's a major, major issue people are paying a lot of attention to. There are many departments, law enforcement, uh, responders like us, fire departments and that kind of thing that have these drones. And there aren't really great alternatives right now yeah yeah hopefully that changes but right it's a major concern for sure so well thank you for doing what you do uh we really appreciate you and and, and doing this thank you for inviting us out thank you so much for inviting me out showing me everything yeah. all these uh capabilities that you guys have for task force 81 um and if anybody wants to start to volunteer here how do they get a hold of you guys well they can call du bois town we're on Facebook, Du Bois Town Fire and EMS. Okay, and when are your meeting nights? Can they just stop by the firehouse and talk to you? First Wednesday night of each month at seven o'clock at night. Okay, so if you guys are out there and you're in the area and you're interested in becoming part of the drone program or a firefighter or an EMT or anything like that, definitely come down. These guys are really good guys. I spent all day with them. Thank you all for watching. This was Task Force 81. But before we end, do us a favor, hit that subscribe, hit that notification, smash those like buttons, make some comments below. We wanna know about your opinion, whether it's about the band or what are you guys using that in your department. Thank you for watching and we'll see you again next week. I can't imagine what I look like on there. <laughs>